Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are joining us for this ninth conversation in our series on global religious and secular dynamics, and the first in this new year, 2021. Uh, my name is Jose Casanova. And I'm an emeritus professor of socio sociology, theology, and religious studies at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, which sponsors these events. Uh, the series is also co sponsored by Reset Doc USA. Um, as always, this conversation is video recorded. And it will be available for everybody on YouTube sometime at the beginning of next week at the website of the Berkeley Center. We are going to follow our normal procedure. We'll first have a conversation with our guest today for about 50, 55 minutes, followed by a question and answer period session. Please, anybody, there is a sign at the bottom for a question and answer, and you can click on it and you can write your question, and I will transmit these questions to our guest. Our guest that today is our very close friend, Professor Robert Hefner, a prominent anthropologist of Indonesia and Islam. And it is a pleasure to have you with us uh, the resume, the brilliant resume, you can read it on our website and the event today. So, Bob, welcome so much to this conversation. Thank you very much, Jose. It's a, a great honor and pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Good. Let's begin with the topic that has been at the center of your life work and democratic civility and civil Islam. In the mid 90s, you directed the project precisely on democratic civility at Peter Berger's Institute for the Study of Economic Culture. I believe this was our first collaboration. Uh, in 1998, and actually, let's, uh, since, uh, uh, let's use this conversation as a tribute to our dear friend Peter Berger, who is also a very good friend of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. So uh, in 1998, after this project, you edited a volume, a collection of essays that came out of the project. And there was actually included an essay of mine on ethno-religious pluralism and democratic civil society in post-Soviet Ukraine. Actually, an essay which has stand uh, well, the passage of time to show the strength of civil society in Ukraine. But anyhow, uh, the idea of civil society was in there in the 90s. Also in the project where our friend Adam Seligman, uh, uh, my, my colleague Andrew Arato, and many others. In 92, precisely, Adam Seligman had published the book the idea of civil society. The same year, Jim Cohen and Rorato published Ideal Civil Society and Political Theory. Two years later, I published my book, Public Religion in the Modern World, that obviously had the idea of public religion in civil society at, its center, at the center of the analysis. Shortly thereafter, I think in the year 2000, you published Civil Islam, which is one of your major works in which you basically uh, gathered these ideas. The subtitle of the book was Muslims and Democratization in Indonesia. Indonesia being the largest Muslim majority country in the world, a country which had been the focus of your own anthropological research for two decades. So can you unpack this idea of civil society, civil Islam, and the promises and limitations it holds for democratization in Muslim majority countries. Well, thank you, Jose. That was an excellent well, introduction you, to a very, very uh, thorny question. Uh, thorny I think question. Uh, uh, we're getting I a little bit of echo uh, here. I'm sorry, I don't know if you are. 
Uh, but uh, I think by the time that you and I began our conversation, which I think was actually in the early 1990s, just perhaps about a year after your book, both you and I were engaging uh, the question of civil society in a broadly comparative context. But I think in today's vocabulary, we both would be identified as post-civil society theorists in one very specific sense. And it was a sense that was reflected in the conference that you, I invited you to and that we, we shared in the midnight, I think the conference itself was in 1996. Namely, we were post-civil society in the sense that we were a bit skeptical about the kind of conventional Tocquevillian truism of the 1990s, which became a truism in the aftermath of uh, the Cold War, that somehow building civil associations or a rich network of associations in society was itself sufficient to, to borrow Bob Putnam's phrase, make democracy work. Uh, associations and some kind of countervailing force in society to to the state, particularly a, a powerful state, uh, can be an, a critical ingredient, I think, in a successful consolidation of democracy. But without something like, a, you know, a Habermasian uh, or a neo Habermasian kind of reconceptualization of the norms, the ethics that shape that public sphere of which civil society is a part, civic associations can themselves uh, have deeply yes. undemocratic or exclusive consequences. We've gotten some recent examples of that here in the United States over the last few years. So you and I came to the question, first of all, we put this idea of civil society in a very comparative context, you with your work in Ukraine, my, me with my work in Malaysia and Indonesia, Indonesia especially, but I was always keen on that comparison. And we were as much concerned with the way in which certain kinds of associational dynamics in society lead to normative or what I think if I may use the phrase public ethical transformations conducive to democracy. Mm -hmm. In the Muslim world, now to shift a little bit to Indonesia and Muslim, uh, Generally, in the Muslim world, this kind of post tukvilian hesitancy, I think, was in particularly important because much of the Muslim world, not all, there's a lot of variation across those uh, 50 so countries that are Muslim majority. But in many parts of the Muslim world, not least of all Indonesia and Malaysia, you have a rich proliferation of associations and society, many of them, particularly in countries, again, like Indonesia, Morocco, even Egypt for certain periods, many of them quite independent of the state, but not all of those associations, in fact, are necessarily committed to a democratic and inclusive practice of Islam or of national citizenship. Focusing just for a moment here on Indonesia, Indonesia among Muslim majority countries, as you said, it is the largest and most populous Muslim country in the world. But it also, when I began working there, which was actually in the late 1970s, it was a country that was just 13 years, 12 years actually, past the mass killings of the communists in the aftermath of a failed left-wing officer's coup in Jakarta the night of September 30th, 1965. And the military, in collaboration with mass-based Muslim organizations, many of which I would soon, uh, several years later in the late 70s, begin my research on the military in collaboration with these Muslim civic associations, Muslim civil society, one about uh, both rounding up and killing communists, alleged communists, but also uh, launching strikes against people who were deemed in some sense re religiously heterodox. In other words, Muslims who were professing a variety of Islam that was seen as unacceptable. So there was a lot of skepticism in the, by the time, you know, I'm in Indonesia, there's a lot of skepticism that Indonesia was a likely candidate for a kind of Muslim democracy in any sense of the world word. But by the late 1980s, early 1990s, which is when I shifted from my East Javanese mountain research to doing research in Jakarta, Indonesian capital, 
working with these same Muslim mass-based organizations that many of which had been involved in the mass killings, there's a good deal of skepticism that these could you know, bring about a democratic reformation. But ironically, two of those mass organizations and one in particular, Nahdlatul Lanma, the largest mass-based Muslim organization in the world with about 60 million informal associates, it became a kind of the cutting edge of democratic reform. Doesn't mean there was a broad consensus within the organization. There were still very, very conservative elements, but it was an interesting and powerful dynamic. And it raised again, I end here, it raised again the question of how you move from a kind of rich associational life, which many Muslim majority countries have, but how you move from that to an actual, actual culture of citizenship that is inclusive and inclusive of people, whatever their, their religious background. So that, that was sort of what was going on and what you were looking at, I think in a very interestingly different way in the Ukraine, that's what I was doing and our project was doing. It was not just a conference, of course, but it was a one year project that involved all of the people to whom you referred, including my colleagues, my future colleagues at, at Cura, Adam Zeligman and Rob Weller, Rob doing research in China. But by the time you wrote the book Civil Islam, uh, there was a real promise that somehow a process of democratization had started in Indonesia that had a strong base. Yes, it uh, in in by the mid 1990s. I, so I during from the in the decade from 1990 to 2000. Again, as I said, I had moved from my East Java mountain research, more classic right. anthropological research. Uh, I had moved to the capital and was working with Nahdlatul Ulama as well as a variety of other Muslim social groupings, not some of which were actually quite, quite anti-democratic, uh, the Dewan Da'wa Islamia Indonesia, for example, the Council of this Indonesian Council of Islamic Predication, which had very strong Wahhabi influences. But the major group, you know, sort of pushing this process of de democratization was the leadership, not all of the rank and file, but is the leadership of Nahdlatul Ulama, particularly under the leadership of the man who would eventually go on to become the president of Indonesia in 1998 or 1999, Abdurrahman Wahid, a man with whom uh, I developed a very close friendship. He visited the United States and me uh, about 10 or 12 times. And uh, from that kind of unusual perch, I, I got both very intimate, uh, personal insights into the efforts of really one of the Muslim world's pioneers of, of, you know, democratization. And then also the pitfalls and challenges. Abdurrahman Wahid uh, was not a great executive leader as president. And he also faced a kind of virulent opposition that uh, perhaps we can talk about later because it does speak to some issues here in the United States and many parts of the world today. We saw in Indonesia after the transition to democracy in 1999, 98, 1999, we saw a three or four years of tremendous de democratic reform, a legislature that passed all sorts of laws on freedom of assembly, unions, women's rights, and decentralization. Indonesia launched the most ambitious program of decentralization the modern world has ever seen. But it also then was quickly followed by outbreaks of communal violence, not least of all in those parts of the country where Christians and Muslims, Christians are about 10% of the population, but in a few areas, they're about 40 to 50%. So in those areas, you saw some, some real uh, communal conflict and more generally to put it, I think in a, in a, describe the process in a way that I think anticipates some of the issues we might want to talk about in a moment. You saw the rise of an Islamic populism with its characteristic epistemological populism, a, a pushback against the subtle jurisprudential, theological and philosophical thinking of the Muslim Democrats and other reformers, people saying, no, 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 that's not just authentic, it's not just consistent with Islamic tradition, but Islam is simple. Islam's message is primarily about uh, uh, us versus them, it's the Muslim world against Western colonizers. So an, an effort to, if you will, not just uh, 
push back against the Muslim wing of the democracy movement, but to push back against an entire intellectual apparatus, which people, which reformers in groups like Nadatu Ulama, and they're in many other parts of the world, in Syria, in Morocco, and not least of all in, in Western Europe and the United States, where you have a very, very brilliant cadre of Muslim intellectuals uh, pushing back against that and saying, no, 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 Islam is simple, its message is clear, and it has primarily to do with this binary struggle, a kind of clash of civilizations, a phrase that right. Islamists have always appreciated from my, uh, my colleague and friend, Sam Huntington, former, uh, the, the late Sam Huntington, always appreciated. And that was the message that they, uh, the, the Islamists sought to use to displace this much more refined cosmopolitan understanding of Muslim democracy. Right. Well, indeed, uh, recently in 2019, uh, you published an important essay revisiting these issues. It appeared in Asian Studies Review with the title, Whatever Happened to Civil Islam? Islam and Democratization 20 Years On. So what is your basic idea there? How hopeful are you are? How much your original kind of prognosis has been to a certain extent uh, fulfilled and how much there are new issues, the ones you are raising on populism and some other issues. So can you give us a kind of an overview of where we are now uh, uh, 20 years later? Well, it's, it's a great question and I'll, I'll preface it by a comment on the Arab Spring, of course, because I always, even though I most of my research has been in the Southeast Asian Muslim world, particularly Malaysia and Indonesia, and then also looking at Muslim minorities in places like Singapore and Cambodia in a very and a much lesser degree. But uh, uh, putting in Indonesia in a comparative context, of course, we're now 10 years beyond the, the Arab Spring. And with the great exception of Tunisia, we can more or less conclusively say the Arab Spring has given way to a bitter Arab winter. Uh, one of the great tragedies, I might say, of modern times, because the Arab world is a world of great intellectual dynamism. Uh, the intellectual resources for a reformation, a democratic reformation in at least many, the majority of Muslim majority Arab societies, which remember are about 20% 20 20 of the world's population is Arab, 80% is, uh, is non-Arab and about 60% of the Muslim world's population lives in South and, and Southeast Asia. So, uh, but at any rate, 10 years on from the Arab Spring, I think we can look back and now and say that with the notable exception of Tunisia, which I think is still a very lively and very hopeful place. Uh, and then perhaps with the partial exception of Morocco, Morocco is a lot, you know, has a kind of a very lively scene. It's certainly not a Senegal. Democratic. Yes. In Senegal. That, well, Senegal, uh, yes. But I was just focusing for a moment on the Arab world. So the Arab Spring has, has uh, yielded great disappointment. But yes, Senegal remains an area of lively democratic vibrance and associational life and great intellectual and I might say just popular cultural dynamism. It's a, and people say, well, wait a minute, that's Senegal. No, Senegal is a very Muslim society. People say, used to say the same thing about Indonesia. They say, oh, well, it's not Arab. The people, most of the people are not native Arab speakers. And I, most of us who work in Indonesia would point out, well, again, that's 80% of the world that is not a Muslim world that's not Arab speaking. So, but to focus briefly then on what has happened in Indonesia, the good news is that the electoral outcome in Indonesia has been consistently, I think, um, favorable. We've had a, a, a successful consolidation of electoral democracy, and the elections themselves have never yielded an outcome in which even moderate Islamists, that is those who seek to establish a state based on what they identify as Sharia law, and which of course many other Muslims say, well, that's, they have a very limited and circumscribed understanding of Islamic law and ethics, Islamic legal traditions. But the Islamists in Indonesia in the national elections have never won more than 25% of the vote. And really, if, you, if you, you do a stricter sort of count, it's more like about 15 to 
So, but at the same time, and here's the sort of the complex story, the public sphere in Indonesia, if we use that term, borrow it in from Charles Taylor uh, and others, Craig Calhoun and uh, Jose Casanova, uh, the public sphere in Indonesia has been the site of, uh, of considerably greater Islamist, not Islamic, but yeah. Islamist progress whereby if you will islamists have you know have benefited from what has been since the late 1980s early 1990s a great upsurge in religious piety all across indonesia something we've seen in most not all but most of the muslim world a great upsurge in re religious observance a key characteristic of which is epistemological in what sense it's epistemological in the sense that it involves debates over how we are to, we as Muslims are to understand Islam and what we are to prioritize, what really matters, if I can borrow a term from the Harvard psychiatrist and anthropologist, Arthur Kleinman, what really matters in the profession of Islam, a, a, a process of ethical prioritization, which as you have shown, uh, has taken place in all of the world's religions in, in modern times, a key feature, as again, as you have shown quite brilliantly, of Catholicism from the 19th century to the 20th century. What are the key values that identify us and that we must uphold in a world that no longer looks like the world that we inherited some centuries ago? That same process of ethical prioritization has given rise to a kind of an epistemological battle, a battle over who has the right, how do we understand Islam? What authorities have the best or most proper and authentic understanding and also most the truest and most just understanding of Islam. And it's, again, it's by, by the Islamic resurgence or Sahwa as it's called in the Arab world, but it resurgence, Kabankitan Islam in Indonesia has been characterized by this real concern of ordinary Muslims, not Islamists, of ordinary Muslims to make sure that more of their life conforms to a proper true Islam and Islam as, as defined by Islamic normativity based on the Quran and Sunnah. And this is not an easy answer. Islamists will push back and say, no, no, it's all clear. There's one Islam, one way of living Islam. But if we look uh, as Ahmad, uh, uh, Shahab Ahmed, the great Harvard scholar uh, who passed away two years ago, as he said in his book, uh, what is Islam? The Importance of Being Islamic, Princeton, 2016. A great book. Ahmed, uh, Shahab Ahmed pointed out that, no, 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 the profession of Islam has always been far more capacious and plural than this kind of modern, kind of essentialized understanding of Islam that Islamists uh, have attempted to present as the core of Islam. So that, it, but these pressures are there in Indonesia. And I end here, these pressures are there in Indonesia and they have, uh, if you will put uh, many ordinary Muslims on the defensive because ordinary Muslims too may not want an Islamic state and will certainly don't want to vote at least in Indonesia for parties calling for the establishment of a so-called Islamic state. But, they, uh, but they're still not sure precisely in terms of dress, in terms of women's roles, male and female relations in the family. There's a whole slew of things. How, what does your hijab have to look like if you're a, a true Muslim woman? There's a whole slew of things that have been interrogated, revisited, and challenged. And some of these, particularly when they, are, they concern Muslim relations with Muslims, have had, if you will, a kind of conservative or exclusivist cast. So the, the broadly inclusive tradition that was, if you will, such a characteristic of Indonesian Islam during the first three, four, five years of the transition, the 1998-99 transition, uh, is, has been put a little bit on the defensive, indeed quite a bit on the defensive. And it's been reinforced, I end here, it's been reinforced by the fact that, if you will, uh, however great in terms of electoral reforms, legislative and constitutional reforms, the Indonesian transition has been, the transition really did not change 
the social structure, the economic structure, the class structure of Indonesia, so that many people who were quite conservative and associated with the 32 year long old order under President Suharto, the people who had come to power in the aftermath of the great anti-communist purge, uh, if you will, that economic elite has remained in place and has found it convenient, a kind of an alliance of co uh, co convenience to find at least on certain issues, common cause with Islamists. It hasn't translated into an Islamist advance in the electoral regime er, uh, area at all, but it has, if you will, on matters of especially uh, nonconformist Muslims, Shia and Ahmadis, as they're known in Indonesia, who are about 1% of the population, Muslim population, but they're quite conspicuous. But also Muslim relations with Christians, with Buddhists. It's, it's if you will, uh, introduced a certain kind of tension, which is felt much more strongly today than it was in the early 2000s. The best example of which, of course, was the 2016-2017 campaign against the Christian Chinese governor of metropolitan uh, Jakarta, Bas Basuki Cahaya Purnama, Governor Ahok, as he was called. And he was, of course, uh, driven from power by uh, in the aftermath of a, of a certain speech he gave. And it, and, but, but things are going on. Indonesia is uh, still a very dynamic and interesting place. If we can move to a related question, which again, uh, very contentious, but very important for, 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 for all these issues, which is schooling, schooling in Islam, the culture and politics of modern Muslim education. You have also uh, focused on this issue greatly. Uh, schooling education has been one of the most contentious issues between traditional religious authorities and modern secular state authorities everywhere since the French Revolution and since the Enlightenment, certainly uh, uh, in the Catholic world, revolving around the question precisely who has the authority to best educate moral subjects uh, and virtuous engaged citizens committed to the res publica and the common good. There are, of course, many models of conflict, uh, coexistence, and collaboration between private religious and public secular education around the world, from the elementary to the university level. Uh, obviously, uh, the Berkeley Center is at the Jesuit University, a Catholic university. Uh, you work in a in a secular university, but again has a, an important center dedicated to the study of religion. Um, obviously, the American model is very different from the French. So, how do these issues uh, basically appear throughout the Muslim world, and especially as Indonesia? In Indonesia, the tensions around the schooling, the role of schooling precisely in uh, uh, helping in uh, informing all these issues, all these questions. It's a great question, and uh, I'll, I'll begin with a little bit of background history. After my work on civil Islam, as I said, Indonesia had a relatively successful electoral transition, but it had more, it had a kind of bumpier ride at creating a more inclusive public sphere. And uh, there was an epistemological struggle going on there. And as, as you are hinting, uh, this epistemological struggle among Muslims had to do with different coalitions and different networks based in the Indonesian case, but this has parallels in just about most Muslim majority countries based in madrasas and, and uh, national educational systems. Uh, Ahmed Kuru, our, our dear friend, uh, is of course who wrote a great book uh, in 2009 on secularism in France, Turkey, and the United States. One of the, one of the things that I took away from that book and that uh, actually uh, I, deep, I so deeply appreciated was just this, the centrality of education, struggles for education, and the control of knowledge production is a key part of nation making and citizen making in those three countries. And of course, that's true today in all of the Muslim majority world. So I shifted and after sort of, you know, the, my work in Jakarta, 
I, I returned in the Indonesian context to a, uh, to a study of Islamic education with the question in mind as to what role education was playing in either a positive or more complex or even negative uh, as a negative influence on the shaping of public attitudes on things like democracy, citizenship inclusivity, relations with non-Muslims, gender values. Very important in Indonesia, perhaps we can come back to that in a moment. But here I, here I, I, I also put, the, I, I led a project in the early, in 2004 to 2006, that included uh, several dear friends like Mohammed Kasim Zaman of uh, Princeton University. He was not just a contributor, but he was a partner in the project. And we looked at Islamic education in 11 countries around the world. And I, based on my work in Indonesia and Malaysia, but I had always expected that this was actually going to be a, a much more positive story than much of, if you will, the Western media and even some Western academia had in the aftermath of 9-11. Of course, some of the, uh, the terrorists who participated in the 9-11 attack had come from uh, madrasas. In 2002, there was a terrorist attack on the beach front uh, resort in Bali, in Kuta Beach in South Bali that killed 200 people, mostly Western tourists. And those uh, people, those killed those terrorists too, had come from actually a small uh, Islamic boarding school madrasa in Indonesia, they're called Pesantren, one that I knew and that I had been to and uh, where I had interviewed, in fact, several times, the director, very, uh, very staunchly militant Islamist director of that school, Abu Bakr Bashir, uh, uh, a man who's still in the news today. So at any rate, there was there was a kind of an impression, certainly in policy circles. And at this point, I might add, I was drawn into a policy debate in the United States in 2002, 2003, that actually involved Dick Cheney, of all people. And uh, uh, it had to do with whether madrasas were really bastions of kind of Islamist radicalism. And in particular in Southeast Asia, not just Indonesia, but Southeast Asia general, whether they were the, gonna, they were sort of the vanguard of Al Qaeda penetration, and the the project that I did with Mohammed Kasim Zaman was designed to explore this question. Uh, I had a sense, and I think the sense was vindicated by the study that actually, here's the the kind of bullet heading, that the story of education in most of not all most of the Muslim world is one of the good news stories, one of the truly good news stories taking place across. The, the Muslim world. There are exceptions. Those Al Qaeda camps, the 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 madrasas in the northwest frontier, the tribal zones of Pakistan. Well, these are not particularly uh, reform-minded educational centers. But in many parts of the world, not just for the in the last 10, 15 years, but for the better part of this, the past century, we've seen the groundwork being laid for a profound transformation of Islamic educational culture, both in relation to the general sciences, the sciences of the world as Muslim scholars called them, and a kind of confidence that what one had seen in Baghdad from the 10th to the 15th century, when remember, and this isn't just kind of romanticism on the part of those of us who work on the Muslim world, no, no, the Muslim world in an area that stretched in particular from North Africa all the way over to Northern India we had the most remarkable centers of science, uh, natural science, medicine, optics, uh, uh, mathematics, as just about anywhere in the world, certainly far and away superior to what until about the 12th and 13th century with the rise of the universities, superior to anything seen in the West. And of course, we know- Well, certainly, rise... certainly Al-Andalus Yes. was, uh, I mean, the Muslim sect was much more superior in these areas than the Christian sections, no doubt about it. A great scholar named Dimitri Gutas has written just beautifully on the way in which uh, these, these Greek natural science and philosophical works that had not really been transmitted and then translated in 
uh, Baghdad, but actually then used as the basis for additional work. The, the Arab scholars, Arab scientists, Arab mathematicians, and philosophers were not passive recipients of Greek scholarship. They were remarkable uh, pioneers. And it was there, most importantly, through a gentleman named Ibn Sina, known in Europe as Avicenna, it was this model of natural science and philosophical education that had been developed by Arab Muslim scholars, but interestingly, not then adopted in madrasas. But it was this model that had been adopted in Andalus, in Spain, that was then studied uh, by uh, a variety of Mus Arab Christian scholars, first in Andalus, but also, of course, in Sicily and southern Italy, uh, and then used as the basis for the rise of the university. So at any rate, there's something very similar to come back, taking place today, a kind of return to that spirit of the Andalus great synthesis and this earlier spirit of a very inclusive and ecumenical education. In Indonesia, just to bring it back home, Indonesia's state Islamic university system and then its private Mohammedia uh, Islamic higher educational system has been among the institutions. Indeed, it has been the most important pioneers of civic inclusive education. The state Islamic university system in Indonesia, which is separate from the secular, if you will, state system, but it's right. supported by the state. It has also been one of the pioneers of, they use the English term, gender mainstreaming. And if you think you say, well, what does that mean? It means exactly what we think. And uh, so, so this is not to say there's been a kind of liberal revolution because it's a little more complex than that. Liberalism since the 1960s right. in the West does not quite look like the liberalism of the late 19th or early 20th century, uh, particularly with regard to things like, as we all know, uh, lifestyle, individualism religiosity and of course sexuality uh, so there's there's differences we were not we shouldn't expect this great educational right. revolution which is and has taken place across broad expanses of the Muslim world it's not going to be derivative of the West it's not a kind of it's not imitating the West it's working within its own vernaculars and its own very expansive horizons to revive and to rediscover and revive and it has this great civilizational legacy from the 10th to the 15th century. So I'm, I'm, I think our studies showed in short, education is not like what if you just are familiar with Taliban and Afghanistan, education across broad expanses of the Muslim world is actually a very good news story. But higher education itself, as we all know, is not enough to transform the whole of a culture. And in, in, even in places like Indonesia, we have discovered, I, in fact, I've been working in the last few years on, if you will, conservative currents in education. And there are major sectors of public education, not higher education, but in the in the grade schools where people who really don't agree with the state Islamic university, civic education, inclusive education, education on citizenship, where they've kind of holed up and they're exercising some influence on young minds. So there's an interesting struggle taking place very much, not at the highest levels, the highest levels of education, Islamic education in particular in Indonesia, like much of the world are really kind of bastions of ecumenicism, but it's at the kind of grassroots, uh, much as it is, I think, in the United States. So let's move to another, but also controversial, contested, contentious issue that you also have worked on namely Sharia law and modern legal structures. Would you have linked link to the ethics of pluralist social recognition and democratization? Again, the tension between the transcendent ethical principles inscribed in Sharia and positive legal status are not unique to Islam. There are similar tensions between transcendent natural law and positive legislation around family and gender issues within the Catholic tradition, but they have become particularly contentious and polarizing issues around constitutional law and family law in many 
Muslim societies. Much of your own work since the publication of the 2016 edited volume, Sharia Law and Modern Muslim Ethics, has focused precisely on these issues. That same year, 2016, you contributed an essay on Islamic law and Muslim women in modern Indonesia in the volume I co-edited with my uh, fellow uh, 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 and colleague at the uh, Berkeley Center, Jocelyn Cesari, on Islam, gender, and democracy. I understand you are completing a book on Muslims, Sharia law, and the quest for a Muslim modern ethics. And also in addition, in the last years, you've been co-producing a film with Sainal Abidin Bagir on plurality, gender, and citizenship in Indonesia. So tell us whatever you want about all these projects. Well, it's, uh, it's a, again, another great question. I'll try to not <laughs> go on too long, but it, my actually my interest in Sharia, of course, was very much linked to the work that I had done on, on uh, madrasas around the world. Uh, obviously the two are linked. The way in which one, the major centers of, if you will, Islamic learning, legal and ethical learning. Sharia is not just law, it's really an entire uh, source of divine guidance, as, which has in fact, in most regards, more to do with personal piety and public piety and public ethics than it does law in a kind of Western positivist sense. But uh, by that research, I had actually begun an earlier project on Sharia politics back in uh, the 2010 to 2012 period in the immediate aftermath of my work on Islamic education and madrasas. And as I said, the two were closely linked. The, the issue is, however, the same as what we were talking about and what you described, I think, so aptly just a moment ago with reference to Catholicism in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, that is the question of Sharia law, a divine guy, a divine set of, a divine body of guidance, uh, has profound parallels with those, uh, with uh, the question of uh, God's commands, God's commandments in Christianity. But the difference, of course, is that East, at least within Sunni Islam, the 80% of the Muslims world population who are Sunni Muslims, you don't have a kind of centralized hierarchy. At times you've had a little bit, you've had a kind of central control, a state control of some educational institutions, but you don't have a clerical hierarchy in Sunni Islam as you do in Catholicism. Instead, you have this broad network of madrasas, of Islamic schools, as well as other uh, associations, Sufi associations are part of this dialogue as well, historically, for the last thousand years. So you have this network of scholars who are always not, if you will, uh, they're all in some sense affirming the centrality of God's commands, God's guidance, God's Sharia. But there's always been, since the very beginning of the Islamic era, 1400 years ago, a kind of an intense discussion a continuing and unfinished discussion as precisely how we are to understand God's commands, the Sharia. It's not, the Sharia is not, if you will, a set of simple commands, certain and clear on all matters. There is, at least in the eyes of many Muslim scholars, there are areas where greater certainty exists. But even these, certainly by the time you get to the 19th and 20th century, but even it had the discussion and the debate had already begun with figures like Ghazali in the 11th century or Al Shatibi, another Andalusian scholar, who had raised the question of what are we prioritizing? What values really are most central to the commands God has given us? And this debate, it's a bit too simplistic, but this debate in modern times has come to focus on, again, the Andalusian scholar Al Shatibi, his and Ghazali earlier, Ghazali's prioritization of what he calls the higher aims of Sharia. It's prioritization of the maqasid, the higher aims, the higher purposes. And the point here, particularly in Al-Shatibi's work, but then it gets this, his work is rediscovered in the 19th century and becomes a kind of center of debate in the 19th and 20th and 21st century, all across the Muslim world, 
his point is that no, 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 the Sharia is not a fixed and finished body of narrow uh, laws, but it, the, the, the laws, God's counsel, counsel has to be understood in a kind of total way, a comprehensive way, not one law, but the law in relation to the entire body of guidance that God has given us by way of the Quran and the Sunnah. So this leads to a very different methodology. And it also opens opens uh, the interpretation of the Sharia. Indeed, it not just opens, it requires the opening of the Sharia, at least in the ideas of uh, the thoughts of many Makassid oriented scholars. Uh, it, it requires a kind of opening of the sciences of God, the sciences of Sharia, of God's counsel to the sciences of the world. So boom, there you have it. It's, it, it's a kind of, uh, first of all, it's a return to a debate that has always raged, but in certain periods, and particularly in the Muslim world. But it's a debate that also has profound parallels with what we saw in the age of uh, Thomas Aquinas and the rise of the universities from the 12th century onward. So that's so again the uh, this kind of debate over what to what really are we to prioritize as Muslims is what I was interested in and interested in in, you know, if you will, bringing to the attention of policymakers as well as academics. But my debt here, I, I must say, is very strong to people like Mohammed Qasim Zaman or Ibrahim Musa, my, my Notre Dame-based colleague and friend, who, uh, or Kisha Ali here at Boston University, right. or Ziba Mir Husseini, a UK-based Iranian scholar. So right. it's, I'm really just, I'm, if you will, serving as a conduit for ideas that are much more richly engaged and certainly substantively engaged um, by these dear friends and Muslim scholars. And this leads us to another issue I want to raise. Uh, your work is, of course, extremely relevant, not only as a scholar that done your own work, your collaborative project, but also your institutional work as director, associate director of the Institute with Peter Berger for many years. You serve as president of the ASEAN, the uh, uh, ASEAN Studies uh, Association Society. You serve as director of the Religion Education Committee of USINDO, the US Indonesian Society it was part of the presidential initiative undertaken by President Barack Obama and Joko Vidodo on religious pluralism in Indonesia and the US. Namely, besides your purely scholarly work, you've done a lot of institutional work and also a work of a public intellectual. So I want you to comment on some of these aspects and how the two aspects, the scholarly and the institutional building and the public intellectual work are related? Well, I worked with for uh, 32 years with uh, Peter, Peter Berger at the Institute on what became known as the Institute for the Study, the Institute on Culture, Religion and World Affairs. Earlier, it was the Institute for the Study of Economic Culture, but the aim, as you know. From Isek to Kura. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was director for nine years. I was associate director for 22-23. Uh, and uh, uh, Peter both, uh, Peter was very generous uh, in, um, and he also, if you will, uh, encouraged something in me that was perhaps in some ways one of my worst habits, which was that I, I he encouraged a kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary scholarship. I had come to anthropology really as an afterthought uh, in the aftermath of my, in my youth, my teen years, you having been an activist in uh, the Catholic workers movement in Cleveland, Ohio, literally when I was in high school, after which uh, I continued work in the anti-war movement and then the civil rights movement. So um, I had always had an interest in the United States and the West and the turn to anthropology, it was as much, uh, was a kind of an excuse to be given the opportunity to study overseas. But it was also, um, it, it, it didn't entirely, never dampen my interest in sociology, social theory, and political philosophy, religious studies. So I, uh, Peter encouraged all those bad habits and cura was uh, a form in which I was able to, if you will, 
uh, get away with this and interdisciplinary. So we are in we are in good company. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that, but I didn't. I I was hoping you might. <laughs> but uh, another consequence of my Cura Association, which I actually am quite grateful for, is that beginning uh, in the early 90s, but particularly in 1995, I began to get regular calls uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, I had, for whatever reason, and I wasn't entirely sure how this happened, about 1994, somebody identified me as somebody who knew Sam Huntington but disagreed with Sam on the clash of civilizational civilization thesis, particularly as regards China and the Muslim world, which was true. Uh, I did know Sam, I was in a, a, a colloquium that he held every month for the year and a half on religion and globalization. He always tolerated me, he always knew we disagreed. But somehow that experience got taken down to Washington and I, I out of the blue received an invitation and the first of what would be particularly uh, from the late 90s to about 2010, six to seven trips a year down to Washington, quite unexpected. I wasn't trained as an anthropologist to be involved in policy work and public intellectual scholarship. But again, uh, uh, the, it in, the invitation encouraged a certain kind of um, a bad habit that I had. And, uh, and it, I, I'm, I obviously I'm being a little bit uh, jestful here, but I, because I did value this, it was a time of particularly after 9-11 of great, great uncertainty and debate in, uh, in Washington. And as I said, at one point, I sort of had the great fortune of being locked in, not face to face, but very much um, meeting to meeting in a debate uh, that had to do with uh, Dick Cheney's much more pessimistic view, to put it mildly, uh, of uh, what the Muslim world was uh, about. And then uh, my own, I hope, more empirically based sense that no, no, the Muslim world's alive and well, yes, like many parts of the world, torn by a kind of agonistic plurality, yes, uh, but a place of great hope and promise as well, dynamism, certainly. So uh, I, I did that, and that Cura gave me that. And our our Ger Georgetown colleague, John Esposito, was part of these uh, conversations, I assume. John was always a major inspiration for me. We collaborated early on. It, I think we were at several of those uh, many uh, State Department meetings together. Uh, John, too, in terms of the way in which he takes his scholarship out to the policy world, uh, was a major uh, model, as were people, you know, who were addressing di different issues. Uh, Tim Shaw down at Georgetown, uh, uh, Tom Farr, you know, religious freedom institutes. There's, I think, something, there's a dynamism at Georgetown it isn't a monolith at all. That's what makes the dynamism good. There's an interesting, in, an interesting commitment to taking scholarship to public policy and relevance. I think expressed most brilliantly at the Berkeley Center that I respect and that I have learned from. So yes, John was part of that. You were part of that, and uh, I have learned from both of you and others at Georgetown. If I may ask your final thoughts on how COVID-19 and the pandemic is affecting developments in Indonesia throughout the Muslim world, those issues of uh, precisely civility, the whole issue of equity, social justice, but also populism, the, the mistrust of experts and science and all the things that we know. If you would like to, to have final comments, just to, to have a sense of how COVID-19 COVID is impacting on Indonesia and the Muslim world. Well, as you mentioned a few moments ago, uh, I've been involved in the production with Zainal Abidin Bagir of Gajah Mada University in Jogja, Indonesia. I, I'm involved in the production of six films. We've been six films that were being produced and shot at precisely the time, at least a year in, that COVID swept across Indonesia. So we've now shifted the focus of one of our films and we're looking at, if you will, the response of religious communities, Christians, Hindu, Buddhist, and of course, especially Muslims uh, to COVID. And it, I think the story will be familiar to anybody who works, who's watched uh, 
the sort of situation in the United States, and for that matter, Germany, France, many portions of the world. You've seen, just as you said, Jose, you've seen a kind of similar dynamic between, on one hand, people, including many religious figures, who are saying, we have to think in terms of the public good, maslaha in Islamic tradition, public good, public virtue in, in Western tradition. We have to prioritize that. Again, it's this matter of ethical prioritization. What does what really matters as one, as a, as a believer, as an Indonesian, as an American, as a Christian, as a Jew or whatever. Uh, these issues are searched to the fore. And in Indonesia, just as in the West, we've seen a tension between, again, those who, if you will say, go with the science and also trust us, trust certain religious authorities, and then certain new religious entrepreneurs who have taken advantage of, and I will use this term again, a certain kind of epistemological populism saying, no, 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 you can't trust the experts. The experts have been bought out, they're inauthentic. And of course, in an Islamic context, this is linked to the accusation that the whole sort of COVID experience was manufactured in the West or maybe in China with the connivance of the West. So there's been a kind of discourse formulated by a fringe in Indonesia that has sought to discredit the government's effort, but equally important, the far more impressive and I think important ultimately efforts of leading Muslim organizations. Once again, those two large ones in Indonesia, Muhammadiyah and Natat Ulama, an effort to discredit them and say that by saying that they are in, in cahoots with, you will, these elite experts who have uh, betrayed the people, the people who in the case of Islamic populism, as uh, my friend Vedi Hadis, an Australian political scientist has analyzed, a, a people who are identified or equated with the Ummah. So it's a similar sort of dynamic, a kind of skepticism, an exploitation of a kind of anxiety and skepticism towards elite knowledge and a claim that if you just listen to me, we can take care, care of this better. But again, the good news in Indonesia is that that epistemological populism has been very, very severely contained. And uh, if we can, if the country can mobilize the resources and get access to uh, to a vaccine, I think the the outcome will be will be good. But the dynamic, interestingly, is very similar. We're see and I know from some of my uh, my colleagues in the Sociology of Islam uh, network, which I'm uh, a member of, and which happens to be one of just a lovely network of scholars, has been a major focus on how different Muslim countries are responding to COVID. And the story is, again, much the same as what I've described in Indonesia, a kind of epistemological populism seeking not merely to push back on, if you will, expert medical knowledge, but using this as an opportunity to discredit mainstream religious authorities. Well, thank you, Bob, for this wonderful conversation. I could continue forever, but I have to leave the audience also have the opportunity to ask you some questions. Uh, there are some comments and questions on the chat. Uh, I will ask you to look at the, at the chat to all panelists and, and, and also the audience. But there is a question from Philip Fernandez um, about the pushback in the binary Islam versus the West. And there's a question about how far has the Indonesian Islamic society become independent of its colonial past? Well, that's a great question. How far uh, is Indonesian Islam uh, ex you know, kind of actively, assertively post-colonial or is it very, I think the answer to that, I'll keep it simple. I think the answer to that is that Indonesia is a country, first of all, that has a long history, this, the, the culture and civilization of the Nusantara, the archipelago region, which eventually in the 20th century becomes Indonesia, is a region that has always been, a, if you will, a recipient and an active engager with many civilizational traditions. Much of its commercial, and I might say, even say technical uh, legacy came first from China East Asia, as well as Southeast Asia, maritime technology is very heavily indebted 
to Chinese maritime technology. And in terms of coins, in terms of metalwork, there were there was a kind of active exchange with other parts of Southeast Asia and, and China. But uh, earlier too, of course, Indonesia engaged and if you will integrated elements of Hinduism and Buddhism, eventually they were displaced. But there was, if you will, a kind of spirit of ecumenicism if I can use that term somewhat anachronistically, there's always been a kind of ecumenicism to Indonesian civilization, whether in its pre-colonial or in its colonial period. So the engagement with Dutch colonialism, even though technically it goes back about 300 years, the actual period of extensive colonization of the entire archipelago was actually less than a century. And it took place again against this Nusantara, this archipelagic legacy of, a, of peoples, diverse peoples. There's more than 172 ethnic groups in Indonesia, although two of them today, the Javanese and the Sundanese together comprise about 60% of the population. But you've got a rich ethnic diversity there. And these are people who are used to negotiating complexity. And if you will, being very critically selective, but also appreciative of their encounters with other populations. So in short, I think Indonesia is, a, is not a post-colonial society deep in the shadow of its Dutch uh, colonists. It's in fact a very a gentle, independent place and a place of long-standing ecumenical creativity. Let's point to a few related questions, one by Malik Faisal Aslam. Um, about the differences in the way in which questions of hijab, polygamy, jihad, Islamic State, banking, interests, and many other issues are debated and contested within Islam. And the question is, is this due to the different hermeneutics of understanding Quran and Sunnah? And do you think education and hermeneutics can reduce this issue? Related, there is more a commentary and by Dana Abdel Kader, uh, saying that Al Satibi is addressing issues that the four Sunni, Sunni legal schools address from the beginning, and he's only addressing Al Daniyat, not anything clearly mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. And then there is a question about uh, um, madrasas, or a comment, uh, are not necessarily institutions that produce any specific trends in the Muslim world. You have products of Madrasa as Varian, as Qutub, and Tasa Hussein. So a question about not generalization, which I think has never been your, 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 uh, your way of addressing this issue. So please, on education, hermeneutics, Madrasas, these questions. Well, the question of how to um, uh, understand Quran and Sunnah is one that, uh, yes, in modern times in Indonesia, I think has been addressed in a, uh, and debated in a very intensive way as it has in most of the Muslim world. But I think in Indonesia, again, because of this legacy of civilizational ecumenicism that they have, it's somewhat different. I mean, the Muslim world in general, certainly the Middle Eastern Muslim world, but also West African Muslim world, these are very, very, ethnically and civilizationally complex places. They're not monoliths, never were, never have been, much less so, in fact, I think, than Christian Western Europe. Uh, they're places that maintained until the 20th century a very vibrant Jewish community and a Christian minority as well, as well as uh, if we look at Syria, if we look at Iraq, if we look at Kurdistan, uh, Anatolia, a variety of, if you will, relatively non-standard professions of Islam. So these are complex places, uh, but Indonesia's ecumenicism, I think, uh, pre-adapted it in some ways to a very, very vigorous and, if you will, non-self-conscious engagement with sciences of the world as well as sciences of the law and sciences of, of uh, divine command. Uh, so, um, but yes, those, those issues have been very, very hotly debated in Indonesia as they have in many, many parts of the world. And there are different perspectives, but the critical point that I wanted to underscore here is that the Islamic higher educational sector in Indonesia, which doesn't determine everything, 
<laughs> at all. There are conservative bastions, quite a few, but the Islamic higher educational system is a real center of dynamism and, uh, and, and uh, ecumenicism, a kind of cosmopolitanism, not of a Western variety. It's not Western derivative. It's engaged with the West, but it's engaged especially with Islamic, uh, Islamic civilizational legacy. So that's, the, I guess I would just agree with the, the premise of the question that yes, these, this hermeneutics is uh, the question of hermeneutics and how, uh, how one is to interpret Islamic ethical legal traditions, particularly as regards Quran and Sunnah, although not exclusively. It, it of course is at the very center of this uh, of this uh, renaissance, I think one can say, that has taken place in Indonesia as in many other parts of the world. But I think Indonesia needs to be given special credit here. Um, yes, you basically, you, you already answered a question by Roger Trick, but you may you want to add something. How much toleration is there of different interpretations of Sharia and how far a tendency to make claims for exclusivity for such claims. I think that you've answered, but if you want to add something. And then the following question from Abdul Tsang, which is again a claim that Indonesian scholars are exclusive. Is this true? And why universities in Indonesia are not growing liberal art tradition? Uh, I, 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 I'll have to ask you again to just to repeat. I didn't, I don't have the questions here before me, but the second question, perhaps we can come back to in a moment. By Abdul Tsang. Why Indonesia scholars are exclusive, and why universities in Indonesia are not growing liberal art education traditions? No, uh, they are. Uh, they are the state Islamic university system, uh, which is huge, uh, and the Muhammadiyah private Muslim higher educational system, which has about 167 campuses. Uh, they have adopted a Muslim liberal arts model, integrating uh, the sciences of the world, as well as, if you will, professional sciences with Islamic sciences. So they're very much, uh, there's a, there is an ecumenicism and an imbrication there. Um, I maybe didn't make that clear, but very much so. In fact, I think uh, when, when I've met with the Iranian scholars, but also Turkish, scholars who in Indonesia or as during my several trips to Turkey, we talked quite a bit about, uh, I talked, I met many Turkish scholars, academics who knew Indonesia and they recognized that the dynamism of Islamic higher education in Indonesia is really quite remarkable. Uh, some of the, my Turkish friends uh, believed and they may be right that there was uh, a, a comparable and perhaps even greater dynamism in Turkey I think the civilizational legacy is different as is, uh, if you will, um, the level of affluence in society. But um, I would say those are two countries along with Iran. Ironically, people, uh, we of course recognize Iran's higher education is subject to very severe restrictions, but historically Turkey and Iran were major centers of educational innovation and innovation that included the sciences of the world. Indonesia has now very much uh, joined uh, that club. So there is in the kind of Islamic liberal arts tradition very much alive and well in Indonesia as is also the case, I think in Turkey and in a more qualified, much controlled way uh, was once the case in Iran. Um, we have three, let's read three questions. We have about five minutes left, and then you can decide to put them together in any way you want. One is actually about given our own crisis within democracy in the United States today, is there anything that we can learn from civil Islam regarding models of governance that can be inclusive and equitable? This is a question that will come from Julie Pierce. Um, then there is a question uh, by Muhammad Abdillah, who asked why democracy leads Indonesian Muslims to strengthen Islamic identity in public sphere on the one hand and nationalism on the other. And then there is a third question having to do with inter-religious conflict, um, uh, pointing out that for a long time in Ambon, 
in Poso, Muslim and Christian uh, live together peacefully. And so uh, why and how could they under, undergo such a massive communal violence in the late 90s? And yet uh, uh, there is a, a, a relative peace now, uh, while in other countries you have inter-ethno inter religious conflict. So the question is, how do you see these patterns of interreligious conflict in Indonesia being so low at some points, then exploding, and then relatively being, being uh, 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 peaceful again? And how does education contribute to, uh, to these patterns? Great questions, three very good questions. And I obviously have to <laughs> do them a disservice by answering quickly. Starting though first with the, the first question as to the relevance, any lessons that uh, civil Islam and the Indonesian case of the, the study of Islam and democracy in Indonesia might have for places like the United States. And as I said, I actually take, took to Indonesia questions that had really, I had first struggled with in my own high school, uh, Catholic workers movement uh, days uh, but questions that included not just, if you will, how to mobilize uh, religious values and religious actors for uh, positive and inclusive social change, but also had to do with the question of why and how social movements and civil society associations, in quotes, can go wrong. And as you heard me say, and this would be my answer to the question, I, I won't be able to do that great question justice, but I think the takeaway from your work, Jose, as well as what I was trying to do and have continued to try to do, was that, you know, um, civil society, a strong civil society is by itself no guarantee of inclusive citizenship or what is, you know, from our earlier discussion, democratic civility. Democratic civility is an attitude and a practice. It isn't just, it isn't kind of, uh, a sweet being sweet to everybody. No, no, it's an attitude and practice of regarding others in societies, not merely with tolerance. Tolerance, I think, isn't sufficient, but with an active commitment to striking some kind of balance between liberty, equality, and acknowledgement of the other. It has to do with a deeper, here I'm with Charles Taylor, and again, Jose Casanova, a deeper social recognition of actors. And I think that's the takeaway from Indonesia's civil Islam, whether in 2000 or 2021 today. But it's also the takeaway from our own democratic travails uh, the last few years here in the United States is that uh, the work of democracy is not finished or done by a se even a separation of powers and the well lubricated functioning of democratic elections. You need a constant, constant participation and involvement in building a public sphere that is committed to some vernacular variation. It will vary across civilizations and societies, but some variety of that democratic civility triad, liberty, equality, and inclusivity, recognition across social, ethnic, and gender differences. That's the takeaway. And it's not easy. It's not elections alone. We've been reminded of that this last week here in the United States. Indonesia was reminded of it after the initially ebullient sort of transition of the first years, 1998 to about 2001, and then the trauma that took place, which will be a good segue to turn to the third question, which had to do with conflict in Eastern Indonesia. Uh, this has been a, this of course was a major focus of mine for several years and I'm still writing about it. The fact that it, there are corners of Indonesia where Muslims and Christians, particularly in the Eastern islands, live in near equal numbers alongside each other. And they had lived relatively peaceably. There were moments of conflict, but they typically did not have to do with communal conflict. After the transition to democracy in 1998-99, and in particular, this great program of, uh, of administrative decentralization that scholars, Australian scholars like Ed Aspinall and Greg Feely have really done superb work on, uh, you, you saw 
a, a decentralization of powers that was, if you will, designed to bring government closer to the people, but it brought government closer to the people, a people who had not yet been societally reorganized in the kind of civil society plus democratic civility and inclusive, a culture and practice of inclusive citizenship way. So what happened then is that you saw, uh, if you were local bosses, <laughs> mobilizing uh, whatever they could for as this decentralization program uh, was brought into place, you got local bo bosses, Christian, as well as Muslim. It was not a, you know, kind of Islam problem. It was a problem of decentralization. And if you will, a kind of epistemological populist, populist leaders, once again, using simple slogans, appeals to ethnicity, appeals to religion, to mobilize against rivals, so as to seize a greater share of those decentralized resources. That was the major problem of the early transition period. And it is because Indonesia has relatively speaking, not absolutely, but relatively uh, speaking, uh, brought, you know, brought into place a more effectively decentralized and effectively functioning decentralized system that the violence was contained. So it wasn't it took on religious colors. There's no doubt about that. Chris Duncan, an American anthropologist, has done brilliant research on this. Uh, but it, it, it took on religious colors. And again, that cheap epistemological populist way that we see in the West today, for example, when French, French secularists of the far right, who have had no interest historically in their Catholic tradition, suddenly rally to the ideals of Catholicism so as what? So as to exclude Muslim immigrants and the 10% of the French population that is Muslim. So populism is, uh, is alive and well and a major problem in many countries around the world. That's one of the lessons, uh, other lessons from Indonesia today. I and guess the, the third, sorry. I think that uh, unfortunately we are running out of time. Uh, it has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Bob, for this you, for this conversation. Indeed, as always, as always, uh, 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 you an anthropologist, but I saw you as a as a great uh, social historical anthropologist. While I see myself as an anthropological historical sociologist, and so uh, uh, I guess we share a mutual admiration for each other's work. And uh, thank you so much, and thank you everybody for participating in yet another of our conversations. We are planning additional ones for February, March, and April. You will receive the announcements on time. Thank you, Bob, and uh, best to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, everybody, and see you Thank next you, month. Everybody.